think without further ado, um, we will introduce this month's featured speaker. Yeah, absolutely. Now there's very few of you who actually don't know Dr. Mark Mitchell, but I'm gonna go ahead and go through the bio because it's a very nice bio he wrote up for us. Um, so he is the research director for the Paleo Res Paleo Cultural Research Group, a nonprofit that conducts research, trains students, and educates the public on archaeology and paleontology, uh, the Great Plains, and the Rocky Mountains. Uh, Mitchell holds a PhD in anthropology from the University of Colorado Boulder and has more than 35 years of experience in archaeological field and laboratory research. His research interests span the archaeology of two different regions the Northern Great Plains in Central and Western North Dakota, and the Southern Rocky Mountains in Colorado and New Mexico. His Northern Plains research focuses on the political and economic development of post AD 1200 farming villages of the Missouri River Valley. Mitchell's Southern Rockies research focuses on Mer American Indian land use in the San Luis Valley and adjacent mountains. He is the author of journal articles, book chapters, and monographs on the archaeology of the Great Plains and Rocky Mountains. And for tonight's IPCAS lecture, Mark will be presenting on the warfare of the Northern Plains and his work at the Melander site. So welcome, Mark. Thank you very much, Brittany. I appreciate it. Uh, I hope everybody can, I've got, I'm unmuted, all right, so everybody can hear me. Uh, you guys are probably the first to see my, my my COVID haircut, which is to say no haircut at all, uh, except for my wife. Uh, so uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to come and, and uh, virtually share with you. I'm gonna try to share my screen, share the entire screen and we're getting there. Okay, get rid of that. Boy, there's a lot of junk on here. And that. And that. So folks that are, is anybody unmuted? Uh, I'm just looking at my PowerPoint. Can you all see that? I got you, Mark. You're good. All right. Yep, we're muted. Can you see this crazy meet Google sharing thing? Yes, uh, I think you can hide it if you click the hide link. Oh yeah, the thing that says hi. <laughs> Technology. Perfect. All right, uh, the work that I'm gonna talk about tonight is a project that uh, PCRG did in 2017 and 2018 uh, in conjunction with the State Historical Society of North Dakota, with the uh, Archaeoimaging Lab at the University of Arkansas, and with Oklahoma State University. Uh, and the, the focus, so we, have, we have a number of research questions we want to answer with our Molander research, but what I want to talk about tonight is what data from Molander can tell us about warfare and also about community planning during the period. Uh, so that'll be our focus, but before we get to that, I think we should do a little bit of orientation. Many of you are not familiar with Northern Plains archaeology, and so I want to try a couple of bits of orientation. We're going to start with a little geographical orientation. So now we're up in space, looking down at the Northern Plains, uh, the Black Hills right here. We have Denver, of course, in the lower left, St. Louis in the, in the lower right, uh, Canadian folks up in the north. The red line, that's the Missouri, from its confluence with the Mississippi down at St. Louis, all the way up to Three Forks in uh, southwestern Montana. And these two arrows here cut off or they show a, a portion of the Missouri River Valley that archaeologists call the Middle Missouri. Uh, during the fur trade era, it was called the Upper Missouri, mostly. Uh, now, archaeologists call it the Middle Missouri. And the area of our interest tonight is this, sort of in the middle section of the Middle Missouri. Uh, we can look at this from another on another map. It shows essentially the same thing. Here, the red line is the Middle Missouri. Runs from the confluence of the Yellowstone down the Missouri to the confluence of the White uh, River. And, and the blue box, in this case, is our area of interest. 
So if we zoom in to that blue box, we see that that's roughly where Bismarck, North Dakota is. And the area that we're interested in is really between the confluence of the Hart River and the Missouri and the confluence upstream uh, of the Knife River and the Missouri. So the lightest, the lightest shade here is the floodplain of the Missouri. Uh, I-94 getting across central North Dakota is there and Bismarck and Mandan. So that gives you a general view of the, of the area. Moland is about halfway between the Hart and Knife Rivers. And if we were flying over Molander today, this is what we'd see. This is a view uh, of the Missouri River Valley, uh, and Molander is just barely out of view off the right-hand side of this image. So we're looking downstream. We're looking at a, a series of buttes called Square Buttes that's quite prominent <clears throat> in the area. And that gives you a sense of what the environment looks like. And here, this is an aerial view of Molander. This is actually a digital elevation model that we created using uh, aerial photogrammetry. We took a big drone out to the site and flew over it and took about 2,000 pictures of the site and the surrounding area and uh, created a, a, a model uh, of the surface. And so this is a hillshade. There's a, 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 a gully, a coulee off to the north, uh, top of the picture. On the right-hand side is a, is a railroad track, uh, and it just barely missed the site, fortunately. It did not miss many other sites, and, and it's been a major impact on archaeology in the area. But it did miss Molander. Uh, the kind of light square around the site itself, that's the property that's owned by the State Historical Society in North Dakota. And our focus tonight is going to be on this thing, this big encircling feature. This is the fortification ditch. Uh, that completely encircles the village. Uh, it's studded with these little uh, projections, which are called bastions. It's a, they're a specialized feature of, of complex fortifications. Basically, each one of those would have held a tower on the inside that would have allowed the defenders to shoot crossing fire down the length of the palisade. Uh, when you see bastions in a fortification, you know that the people who built it were serious. Uh, that's a that's a complex feature. The site's in pretty good shape, apart from a homestead that was plunked on top of it in 1882. Uh, but the site has been owned by the State Historical Society of North Dakota since 1935. Uh, and really, it's in quite good shape. And that gives us a chance to do what we're going to do tonight, which is figure out how hard it was to build that fortification and, and what it means for warfare. So. Let's do a little cultural orientation. That puts us in space. Let's put us into a little cultural orientation. Uh, we know something about the site, uh, or the, the most detailed thing I should say we know about the site. It's from Lewis and Clark. It's from the Lewis and Clark expedition. And what you're looking at here is Clark, William Clark's map of the river valley, that sort of sinuous, snaky looking thing. Uh, that's the Missouri River Valley. Uh, in 1804. And this is his drawing of it. I've turned the map uh, 90 degrees counterclockwise, so all the, the writing is, is the wrong direction, but I wanted to make it so that north was up. Uh, and what we see here on the left-hand side are five little sort of fuzzy blobs. Those are five settlements, five villages, where the Mandan and Adatsa peoples were living in 1804, when Lewis and Clark came. And these five villages were quite well known to them. Many other explorers and, and fur traders had been there. Uh, and this was their destination for the winter of 1804-1805. That small orange circle that's labeled Fort Mandan, that's the weird triangular building that Lewis and Clark built uh, to winter over in 1804-1805. And if you look along the river course downstream from Fort Mandan, you see here uh, a bunch of little fuzzy dots. Those are abandoned villages, villages that were apparent on the landscape but that no one was living in in 1804. And if we go a little farther down, we see Molander. Uh, and the uh, informant that told Lewis and, or that told Clark about Molander said that it was an Adatsa site that had been, in his belief, uh, abandoned about 40 years, uh, 40 years in 1804. So 
if we look at what we know about history based on Lois Clark and some maps and some other historical journals, and we look at the results of our excavation work and our analysis of material culture from the site, uh, we kind of can distill it into a couple of key points. I think Molander was occupied by uh, the Alhawi division, uh, a subgroup of the Adatsa tribe. So Adatsa peoples were living there. Uh, the village was built about 1735, we think, abandoned about 1765, so mid-18th century. Uh, that fortification encircles 5.2 acres, so it's big. Uh, if you have to walk back and forth across it during a project, you get your steps in, because it's about 200 meters east-west and about 160 meters north-south. We think that about 400 or 450 people live there. So that gives you some basics about who and when. Uh, let's talk, though, a little bit about sort of the broader context of the Adatsa people. They were newcomers. They were newcomers to the Missouri River Valley compared to some other folks, compared to the Mandans in any case. Uh, the Awahawi arrived on the Missouri about 1600, so only about 150 years before uh, the occupation at, at Molander. Uh, but like the Mandans, who had been living on the Missouri since the 1200s, early 1200s, uh, and some other groups, uh, they practiced a, an economic system, an economic orientation that archaeologists call the Plains Village Pattern. The Plains Village Pattern is very widespread from, say, 900 up to 1800, all across the plains, southern plains, central plains, northern plains, and different languages, different cultural traditions, but they shared this economic orientation. And we can kind of boil that down into oh, five, spot, five main points. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about each of these in a minute, but just to uh, run through them quickly first, uh, a mixed hunting and harvesting economy, agriculture and hunting. Uh, they built substantial houses, timber frame houses. Uh, Plains Village sites are located uh, adjacent to quality agricultural land. Uh, they did a lot of storage, a lot of surplus production and a lot of storage. And then in different parts of the Plains Village universe, uh, specific bone, stone and uh, tools and, and pottery. So let's break that down a little bit. Uh, there's a big debate among archaeologists. Can we think of these guys as maize farming bison hunters? Or should we think of them as bison hunting maize farmers? Well, the truth is uh, both fit probably for different groups in different ways, and it changed over time. Uh, but these two resources, these are two super abundant resources, right? Uh, enormous bison herds, very good, high quality agricultural land, very productive. Uh, so they had two uh, really important uh, resource pillars that they leaned on uh, in various degrees. If we look a little bit more closely, though, we see that it's actually a lot more complicated. Uh, we see a lot of fishing. Here's a fishing weir in the Missouri on the right, uh, shell fishing, upland game birds, small mammals of different kinds, a lot of wild fruits, a lot of wild weedy plants. There's folks, uh, this is Edward, on the left is Edward Curtis's shot of uh, uh, folks gathering buffalo berries, uh, now considered an antioxidant superfood. Uh, so more complicated than just bison and corn, but those two things are the mainstay. Uh, substantial architecture. This is Edward Curtis's view of a Mandan Lodge. This might be a bit, a bit of a set piece, but it shows you a little bit about the size of them. Uh, and we know a lot about them from the time period. Uh, this is uh, Carl Bodmer's view of a, the interior of a Mandan Earth Lodge in uh, 1833. Uh, he visited, he went in there and he saw this stuff, right? Maybe somewhat stylized, but he saw this. Uh, off on the left, you see the ponies, there's pottery, there's dogs, there's boat paddles, there's spears, people sitting around doing things. You can see how really massively substantial the building is. So we know a lot about architecture. Uh, other Plains Village societies had somewhat different kinds of architecture, but at least for the Mandans and Adats, as this was common. Uh, but they weren't solitary, right? They were lived in villages. And here, this is uh, George Catlin's picture of the same village uh, a year before. Catlin was not the artist that Bodmer was, but 
shows you how tightly packed the village was, how many people were there and how tightly these big buildings were packed together. And these places weren't just out on the prairie somewhere. They were next to quality agricultural land. Uh, this is a map showing uh, that same area we're talking about. The Hart River is kind of in the center of the map, right where Bismarck is. Each one of those dots is a, is a uh, Mandan uh, or a Datsa settlement occupied after 1500. So this is only the late villages, uh, right along the river, right along the major creeks running into the river. Uh, they were tethered to farmland. You don't see these villages away from the river. So again, proximity to agricultural land, quality agricultural land, lots of storage. They produced a huge surplus a lot of it was put into cash pits. This just gives you a sense of the size of one. Uh, this is a University of Missouri field school student. She's crouching down, but you can see how big this thing is. And a lot of them are you know, that big or deeper even. And then finally, uh, quite, a, quite a large diverse artifact assemblage. So large, in fact, that we typically do what's called water screening. That's what these folks are doing. Uh, to, to capture all the material that comes out of the ground. And th this is not a Molander, but to give you a sense of the kind of stuff that does come out of the ground, uh, here's a picture of stuff. This is from Molander. Uh, bison bone, pottery, uh, burned rock, stone tools, uh, seeds, corn cobs, shell, uh, some trade goods uh, in the 18th century at Molander. So you can see how rich some of the deposits are. So that's a little bit of cultural orientation on, on Plains Village societies. Let's now shift our focus and talk a little bit, a little bit about warfare to kind of set up what we're going to try and do tonight. When we think of warfare on the Plains, we often think of Plains Indian Wars, right? This is a Kiowa ledger drawing of that may be of a 1874 engagement between the Army and the Kiowas on the Southern Plains. Uh, that's certainly the image we have, right, of, of Plains warfare. Uh, and we know from historical accounts and, and oral historical records and winter counts and all sorts of native and non-native documents that warfare was endemic on the Plains then. But we also have this incredibly rich archaeological record of warfare as well. Uh, and there's signs of it all over. Uh, we see it in rock art. We see images of battle. We see it in ledger art that what we were just looking at was a ledger art drawing. Uh, we think we see it in where sites are located in certain contexts. Uh, we see evidence of villages having burned down catastrophically. Uh, we certainly see evidence on human bodies, on human remains uh, of violence, and, and plausibly some of that violence is related to armed conflict, uh, organized large-scale armed conflict. Uh, we also see fortifications, uh, and that is uh, one of the most commonly observed traces or signs of war, particularly in the middle Missouri region. Now, some of this stuff, it really is probably a record of, of a particular battle. I know this picture is not great. It's one I took at a place called Writing on Stone, which is in southern Alberta. And this is just a, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a rock art panel that's very complex. This is a tiny squib of it. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see uh, five guys with guns. Uh, let me see if I can point out the stock. Here's the, the stock. This triangular thing is a gun stock. Another one here. Another one here. Uh, and there's the barrel. And they're shooting at some folks over here. Here's one of the defenders. Uh, and one of the attackers has gone out in front of the line heroically. And he's got a, a lance or a a acoustic that he's holding, uh, and the defender is shooting at him, perhaps striking him. Uh, this is not generic. This is about a particular battle, and, and this panel is actually very large, has lots of different elements. Uh, this is a record. This is a historical record. Uh, so some of the evidence we have is of this type, uh, but fortifications are different. They're not about particular battles, uh, they're not about uh, any any battle at all, necessarily. They're about how people feel about warfare, what the community sentiment about warfare is. Uh, you don't build them unless you're worried. 
they're expensive. And, and one of the reasons we're doing this Molander project is we wanted to know how expensive. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but it's, it's anticipatory, right? You build them because you think you need them. Uh, there's a huge or long tradition in this middle Missouri region of warfare, of, of fortifications, excuse me. Uh, this, is, uh, this is actually a late woodland site in North Dakota, early 1200s. It's got a fortification, sort of a weird one, but it's got one. Uh, here's another site in the mid 1400s, uh, probably the best known fortified site. Very complex, very highly engineered, very carefully built bastions, all sorts of specialized defensive features incorporated into it. Uh, we also have uh, evidence of repeated reconstruction of fortifications. Now, I realize this is a bit of a complex illustration, but what we're seeing here is a very large village, about uh, three times the size of Molander. Uh, if I can get my cursor, here's my cursor. So this ditch four on the perimeter, that's the earliest uh, fortification, all full of bastions. Uh, and about over 1,500 people lived in this place when that was built. Uh, later on, ditch three was built, uh, just a little bit smaller, or sp smaller area enclosed. Uh, this is ditch three. After that, ditch two. After that, ditch one. So a progressive contraction of the settlement but a reconstruction of the fortification each at each point of contraction. So we have a long history of, of rebuilding of fortifications. And that gets us back to Molander. We, uh, you've seen this, these bastions on a lot of these other sites. Uh, you've seen the, the ditch. Uh, let's, let's break this down a little bit and, uh, and see what we can learn about how hard this thing was to make, to build. Uh, Let's, let's put a little human scale on it. So here are a couple of pictures of folks working at Molander. Uh, in the upper left, or sorry, upper right, are two students from Oklahoma State University. They're, of course, sitting, but uh, you can see the sort of magnitude of the ditch. It's about half filled up. Uh, on the lower left is a fellow, a graduate student from University of Arkansas doing a magnetometer study of the village. He's walking through it. You can see it's uh, probably over waist deep on him. Uh, and as I say, it's partially filled back in. If we look and see what they look like when they are open, this is what they look like. This is not Molander. This is a double ditch. Uh, but it gives you a sense of the scale of the thing. Now, this is Ann Johnson. Some of you may know Ann or remember her. She was in, she's a, uh, ar an archaeologist who lived in the Denver area for a number of years. And she helped the Denver Cast Group do some of the Ken Carroll Ranch write-ups. Anyway, uh, Anne, Anne's not a particularly tall person, but she's not kneeling. She's standing. So you can see how deep it is. Uh, I also point out behind her a series of post molds. That's the palisade. So these would have, there would have been a series of vertical wooden posts standing up behind the villa or behind the ditch uh, inside the village, right? These ditches don't work unless they have a, a wooden palisade to block people's entry. The palisade and the ditch work together. So that gives you some sense of the scale of the thing. Now, if we look again at, at Molander, we have to kind of divide our, our analysis up into two bits. Uh, on the Cooley side is what I call a cut terrace. It's not a ditch per se. It's more of a, a slope break. And if we look at a cross section of that slope break, you can see the light dashed line. That's what the slope was before the cut break, before the cut terrace was excavated. There's a little bench, uh, and the palisade presumably would have been on that little bench. So there is some excavation required there. The rest of the ditch, uh, we excavated uh, across the ditch to find out how deep it was and how wide it was. Uh, and we saw that it, at the top, it's about three and a half meters wide, uh, and it's about 1.4 meters deep. Uh, the box and whisker plot is the, our, our depth, and they show depth and width measurements for other Heart River or other uh, fortifications in this area of interest around Bismarck. Uh, so you can see that the Molander uh, ditch is, it's big, 
but it's not outside the re the range of other ditches. Uh, it's it's toward the top end in, in in both depth and width, but it's not outside the range. All right. So how big is the ditch then? Well, and and the terrace. The the ditch is is 440 meters long, if we calculate the length of it from our uh, from our uh, elevation model. As I said, it's three and a half meters wide at the top. Uh, it's about uh, not quite uh, uh, a meter wide at the bottom, so it's a little bit V-shaped, a little narrower at the bottom than wide. Uh, and as I said, it's about 1.3, 1.4 meters deep. The cut terrace is 152 meters long, about four meters wide. And if you do some some back of the napkin math, you can average out the, the quote unquote, I'm doing air quotes, which you can't see, uh, at about a third of a meter deep. Now, we can't forget about the palisade. Uh, the palisade, of course, is not present anymore. But if we figure that the setback on average is about four and a half meters, from the ditch to the palisade at, at other sites, uh, then we can calculate that the palisade at, at uh, Molander would have had to have been about 575 meters long. So that's that's the scope of what we're talking about. Now let's let's dig a little deeper, huh? Pun not intended, I guess. How much volume is represented by that ditch, 440 meters long? Well, if we do the calculations. Uh, the folks who built it had to remove almost 1.4 million liters of sediment to create the ditch. To create the, the uh, cut terrace, they had to remove about 270,000 liters of sediment. And to fill up that palisade would have required almost 1,800 posts. These posts would have been, oh, in the order of six to eight inches in diameter and, and something on the order of Two to, two to four meters high, tall. Uh, and that calculation is based, again, on some regional data uh, at about three posts per meter. So they're not, they're not touching each other. There would have been some kind of structure between the posts to make it a, a, a continuous enclosure. So what's involved in doing that work? Well, if we figure that uh, each excavator can move 25 basket loads a day, and each basket load is, say, 20 liters, that's a pretty hefty uh, Home Depot bucket. That's about two-thirds of a Home Depot bucket. Uh, if you've been on an excavation, 25 buckets a day in, in an archaeological excavation, that's moving out. That's a lot of buckets. Uh, you know, and, of course, they were having to pry out sediment from an intact terrace deposit. So that's doing a bucket every 10 or 15 minutes all day long. If you want to put up those posts, those 1,800 posts, uh, and you got two-person teams, if they can do 10 posts a day, uh, there's th 356 person days of, uh, of time devoted to installing the posts. And that doesn't count in time installing the cross pieces and hides or other material that would have made it continuous and solid. So 3,600 person days. Now, before we think about what that means, I want to give you a little bit more excavation data. Uh, as I said, we, we excavated across the ditch. Make sure my time is good here. Yeah, we're doing okay. Uh, we excavated across the ditch to get a sense of how deep it was and how it was built and so forth. One of the questions we had is, was it built first before the village? Or was it added later? Was it built first or was it added later? And if we look at the, the profile again of that excavation, this is it's vertically exaggerated to give you a better sense of it. Uh, so the, the drawing is uh, 30 meters long, but uh, only about a meter and a half tall. Uh, outside the village is to the left, inside to the right. Uh, and that dashed line, that's, that is where we saw the, the soil that occurred under the ditch spoil. Uh, and that was the soil that was present before the village was occupied. So the idea is that the material was scooped out of the ditch, 
center line of the ditch is at about 225 meters north. That's the grid line. And that material was thrown outside to the left. And that's where it says spoil. So that, mu that mound or that hump on the outside, that's the spoils from the ditch. And down below, you can see what that looks like. Talk about heinous digging. This is, uh, these are glacial till deposits that they had to dig into to create the ditch. So the lower half of the ditch was nothing but these boulders and clay and sand and gunk that they had to pry out with digging sticks. Remember, no shovels, no beasts of burden, uh, all by hand, all with baskets and all with digging sticks. Uh, so they threw it to the outside and you can see kind of a brown layer underneath those rocks. That's that soil that occurred before the uh, ditch was excavated. Uh, and we put this in a little more context. This shows you where we excavated outside the ditch, ditch in the sort of middle distance. Uh, you can see that ditch spoil, the, the, the till material. And then under it, that uh, fuzzy grayish brown layer, that's the A horizon of the buried soil. And there's no archaeology on that. That tells us that they built the ditch before they built a village. If it was the other way around, there would have been village debris. There would have been a bone and pottery and, and other uh, domestic refuse on top of that surface. Uh, there isn't. So the ditch was built first. So when they got to this place to create the, the settlement, they said, this is where we're going to be. Step one, build the fortification. Step two, build houses. Remember, timber frame houses. So... Uh, a significant amount of work in and of themselves, but the ditch was first. All right, so let's kind of bring it all together. What the heck does this actually mean? All right, what are the implications? It's a big job. That 3,600 person days, if you had 45 people doing it, 45 people on your crew, it would take 80 days to build the, to dig the ditch and put up the palisade post doing nothing else, right? That's uh, a tenth of all the people that ultimately lived there. Now you weighed out old people, I'd include myself there because it seems like hard work, uh, but you weed out older people and children and folks who had to be engaged in other activities to keep the community going. Uh, that's a significant share of the population. You also got to live somewhere else while you're building the, the uh, the ditch. Remember, it's the first thing. So there's no houses yet. There's no place to live. They had to come from somewhere, some other settlement uh, that predates, say, 1735. So, uh, so they had to plan ahead. They had to stockpile those 1,800 logs, which meant that they had to cut them down first. Uh, they had to drag them up to the site. Uh, they had to maintain their other village while they had a tenth of their population at this site. Uh, and uh, 80 days, that's a better part of a growing season. So they're taking all those people out of agricultural production for an entire year. And they had to be supported. They had to be fed during that time, right? So they had to have a massive surplus of material and food and equipment that would allow them to do this. This is no small feat. This is planning ahead. So what does it tell us about warfare? Well, it tells us that they were nervous. It tells us that they were concerned. They didn't go through all of that effort uh, for no reason. Uh, it wasn't window dressing. They considered it to be necessary. Now, whether or not they actually ever were attacked, uh, we don't know, although we have some historical evidence that suggests that, in fact, they were. They had reason to uh, be concerned. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it, it represents uh, uh, a lot of anticipation of war. That tells you something about the nature of war. Uh, it also tells you something about the nature of village leadership. Uh, they didn't wake up one morning and say, hey, let's move and let's do it this way. Uh, there's a lot of planning. There's a lot of leadership. There's a lot of, uh, you know, they had to come up with a design. They come up with location. Uh, they had to task people for all these resources they needed to do it. So uh, it tells us a lot about the nature of leadership in these communities. 
And I think that's important. I think that th those things uh, tell us a lot about the nature of the times uh, in the 18th century. Uh, and we can perhaps infer that, that these same factors were true in earlier time periods as well when fortifications were important. So we have lots more to say ultimately about the Molander project, but that is uh, what I wanted to tell you tonight. Uh, I should probably give you some homework. How about some homework? Uh, no, I'm kidding, of course. Uh, if you want to know more about Plains Village archaeology, uh, here's a couple of things you could pick up on Amazon that you might find of interest. Uh, a classic by a guy named W. Raymond Wood, the dean of Plains archaeology, uh, often used as a textbook. Uh, it doesn't just cover Plains Village, it covers all of archaeology on the Plains. Uh, a more recent book that covers uh, Plains Village specifically and North Dakota specifically. So if you're interested in, in, uh, in the, what I've been talking about, there's more about that in there. Uh, here's a shameless plug for my own work. If you want to know more about the economy and society of, uh, of the area I've been talking about, I published this a number of years ago, uh, primarily about the Mandans, sites a little bit south of Molander. Uh, but some of the same issues at play. And if you want to know about warfare, specifically on the plains, I'd recommend picking this up. One of the editors is a fellow named Doug Bamforth that I think many of you know. Uh, this just was published a couple of years ago. It has some great pieces on uh, uh, various aspects of warfare, uh, archaeology, and uh, from, from the perspective of archaeology and history. I also have it uh, on good authority from Doug that a book he has written about uh, Plains archaeology, uh, probably an advanced undergraduate sort of uh, textbook, is in production. And so uh, I, uh, it's not yet available, but it will be, I imagine, in the next year or so. Uh, and if you are interested in what we do, uh, or uh, and, and specifically North Dakota archaeology, Check us out. You can check us out online, paleocultural.org. We even feature Molander on the front page of the website. Uh, we were very sad uh, this year, as, as many of you know, to had to have uh, 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 canceled the field season uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, next year, we have our fingers crossed, our toes crossed for a good vaccine and lots of safe, healthy behavior They'll let us get out in the field. And we should have at least two projects uh, on Plains Village sites in North Dakota next year, as well as projects in Colorado. So I encourage you to consider joining and consider coming out with us. I know many in the group have. And uh, if you don't believe me, you can you can ask them to vouch for the, the process. Anyway, I'd, I'd be happy to entertain any questions that people might have. Uh, might get us back. Where are we? There we are. Oh. So, questions? Right. Questions? Anybody make sure to unmute your button. Okay, Mark, I do have a question for you. Uh, where is the nearest source of timber to the Molander site, at least in the mid 18th century? That's a great question, Chris. Uh, you saw from the picture that there's not a lot, right? So what you had to do was get it in the in the valley bottom. And today there's there's timber in the valley bottom along the Missouri. But remember, the Mandans have been living on this ground since the 1200s. Were there any trees? I don't know. Uh, maybe not. Uh, so you might have had to go quite a distance. It could have been, that alone could have been a huge undertaking. Uh, but the fortification doesn't work without them. So uh, that may again suggest that it was really key. Thanks, Mark. You're welcome. Anybody else? I got a question, Mark. Can you hear me? Yep. Hey, Rob. Um, who are they fighting with? The Mandans or other Hadatsas or who, 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 why are they fortifying against who? Yeah, you know, I, I alluded to some historical 
uh, information uh, specifically about the Al-Khawi Hadatsas uh, having been attacked uh, maybe at Molander and then perhaps at the next village they occupied by the Blackfoot. Now, whether or not, what, what the time depth of that Idatsa Blackfoot conflict might be, I really have no idea. But there is some oral historical data recorded by Bowers that suggests the Blackfoot were, uh, were again them. And of course, these, this, fo this group, as Rob knows, but many of you may not, the, this group, the Awahawi Idatsa, they ultimately moved to the Knife River to one of those five villages. So this same group was present uh, when Lewis and Clark came through uh, they were at another settlement called Amahami Village, uh, but same group, uh, part of the Adatsa uh, divisions. Uh, so they they didn't leave, and and even more broadly, Adatsas, Mandans, and and Arikaras really never left. You know, you can go to the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation that's uh, 80 miles upstream and uh, talk to them right now. So they're still there on the landscape, and they still have an investment in in these sites, including Molander. Other folks? I, I, Amy, I, I'm, I, I can't believe you're not, you're not asking a question. You were there. Amy. Um, I, do, I, I do have a couple questions. I was trying to figure out how to frame them. Um, the first one that came to mind was, I remember that that trench across the ditch to kind of look at that stratigraphy and you talked about that um being your example for um showing that there was the the fortification came before the village site right um i was curious if there were any other smaller ditches or trenches put in just to check that in other areas of the fortification zone like the ditch zone yeah and uh, then if there was any evidence of living on site, like instead of commuting in or or coming in from another area, was there any evidence for, I, I don't know if this was something you guys look, looked at specifically in the project, but people just staying there and fending for themselves as they're doing the construction project. Yes, yeah. uh, so to, to address your first question, uh, we didn't excavate across another part of the ditch, but we, excuse me, we did do a bunch of coring along the length of the ditch. Uh, and we have this great surface model that shows us that that spoil pile that we saw in cross-section, it goes all the way around. And it's very consistent and even. So it, it tells us that the sort of formation process of that ditch is the same along its entire length. Uh, in terms of uh, occupation, well, surely that those 80 people, if that's how many they had, uh, or excuse me, 45 people, they had to live somewhere and, and no doubt they put up some kind of structures, uh, but possibly not earth lodges. Uh, and so, and, and there is a little bit of evidence of pre-ditch occupation, um, not a lot, but a little bit. So we suspect that folks may have been there for some period of time. Uh, it's a little, the, the evidence is a little complicated because there's also an archaic site, an archaic occupation at the site. Uh, and evidence of that archaic occupation kept getting dug up every time the villagers put in a cash pit or dug the ditch. Uh, and that material is sort of scattered around in a complex way. Uh, but in general, we, we don't find substantial evidence of occupation before the ditch was, was built. Okay, cool. That's awesome. Thanks. You bet. Anybody else? Mark, I don't know if I'm getting through. You are, Madeline, yes, hi. Good. You mentioned at the beginning something about human remains told about fighting. Did you find human remains burials in the vicinity of this fortification? Uh, fortunately, no. Uh, it's one of the things I never want to do. Uh, well, I know there's NAFTA and all, but I mean, uh, no, even beyond idea. that, I, I don't care to uh, okay. be exposed to it. But the short answer is no, not okay. there. I was speaking more generally. There certainly are cases of, of truly horrific violence uh, 
perpetrated on people's bodies uh, from other parts of the middle Missouri that show us that, uh, that what we're looking at is not the results of fights or uh, disputes, but uh, truly large scale massacres. Real uh, examples of that. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, and there, there may be, I'm sure there are many more that we're not aware of, but there are some examples that tell us that uh, warfare on the plains was serious business. Mm -hmm. I've got a question. Um, what are the, I, I guess the, the, the way to, the simplest way to ask it were, why were people there? Or, or rather just because you brought up the idea that these people would have had to come from another settlement to, to build this, uh, this structure. So what are the kinds of the group dynamics that were present in Plains populations that would have motivated them to fission and 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 set up new settlements in that area yeah that's a that's a great question christian it's uh, uh there's a lot of good oral historical evidence about the processes of community fission uh, it has a lot to do with leadership disputes it has a lot to do with conflicts over access to resources uh both within groups within communities causing them to break into many smaller communities or between uh, uh, groups that are living in different communities but are in close proximity and are perhaps competing for separate resources. Uh, so there's quite a bit of good evidence for the role of, of leadership and, and resource conflict. Uh, mm -hmm. There's also some pretty good evidence for the opposite, which is uh, fusion of groups or aggregation of groups uh, for mutual protection mm -hmm. and also for economic reasons uh, to, to, to uh, make local markets possible. If you live close proximity to the, your, your trading neighbors and your partners, uh, you can go back and forth. If you, can, if you can go to the neighbors in an hour and come back, uh, you know, if they really, if you have a good, strong economic or, or political relationship with them, you want to move close. You don't want to make it be days that you have to go to travel between groups. So, so there's both, both forces are working, pulling people together and breaking them apart. And that dynamic is, I think, what causes uh, aggregation of sites and fissioning and establishment of new sites. Now, the specifics. What people did, when, where, I don't know. But right. the, the cultural and economic context, I think, is pretty clear. Yeah, cool. Thank you. That's really good. That was really good. I, and, and thanks for uh, taking me beyond just thinking about fission and thinking about fusion, too. <laughs> hey, Mark. Uh, hey. Is there also, uh, in terms of like people moving, like Chris was saying, uh, would building all these you know these palisades and all these earth lodges you're gonna use a lot of timber yeah. and and you know then you're also gonna need wood to, to fix them and firewood and hunting do, do they kind of deplete resources particularly timber or maybe local game and have to move on is there any evidence of that or is, i know there's speculation about it but what do you think about that yeah you know i that's one of my favorite questions honestly rob because uh bowers uh, this is i'm speaking about alfred bowers Rob knows who, who's, who Bowers is, but for the rest of you, a fellow named Alfred Bowers, who was an ethnographer that worked in the early 20th century with the Mandans and Adatsas. Uh, a number of his informants told him that, quote, they had to move on because they ran out of wood. Okay. No reason not to believe that. But when you look at sites on the landscape, they don't move. Double ditch village was there for 300 years. So which is it? Did they move or not? Well, there's some ethno ethnographic evidence that maybe they did, but maybe they just think people did because it doesn't really seem like people did, uh, at least after 1500. And this might actually get back to, to Chris's point. 
which is that uh, when people live farther apart, less aggregated communities, there was a lot more open ground to move to. But once you're locked up in this complex sort of weave of multiple villages, there's nowhere to go. So then you got to just get your stuff wherever you can get it. And if you have to go a long ways to get it, then that's what you got to do. Because they kind of pile up around the Knife River and around the Heart River, and they just don't leave uh, until essentially smallpox drives them out in, in, uh, in 1782. Well, thanks very much, folks. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. Sure hope that some of you will consider uh, coming to join us on one of the projects up there. Uh, they're a lot of fun, and, and I think you would uh, enjoy it. Amy's been up there. Rob's been up there. So uh, hope to see some of the rest of you. Thank you so much, Mark. Thanks, we really Mark. enjoyed it. Have yeah. a good night. You too. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Mark. Thank you.